gang here in the house of the Lord. Amen. So I want somebody that's very special um, to me and Susan, and that's Miss Jerry Hill. She's going to come up. We just honor her, um, her and her husband, late uh, Steve Hill, the Brownsville Revival. Y'all give Jerry a hill. But um, Jerry preaches with that fire as well. And Jerry's going to be here with us, I think, October 11th. And uh, we're just going to see what God's going to do. So we're excited to have Jerry here with us. And Ryan's Hope, you're right here on our campus. Raise your hand, Ryan's Hope, guys. We love you guys. Our hope. We're just so thankful um, that they're here with us, as always. And uh, it's good to see you guys, your smiling faces. But uh, David and Nancy Raven Hill are here. They're getting ready to move back to Arkansas. I, I told David, I said, man, you've got to come preach before you head back. Leonard Raven Hill was his father. And I didn't know this, but my dad was friends with Leonard Raven Hill. And I was told that when he would come to our house, I would climb all over his back as a little kid. They would kept tell me, get off of Brother Leonard, Steve. And so I found that out. I'd be crawling all over him and messing with him. But uh, we're just honored to have them. So what I've done is I've asked Jerry just to greet you for a few minutes this morning. And then she's going to introduce David because they're, they're good friends and they go way back. So she's going to introduce them and then you just take your little brother again. Yes. Well, it's good to be here with you guys this morning. And he was talking about revival. When it talks about revival, we don't see the word revival in the Bible. But it does say, revive me, yes. oh God. Yes. And that's exactly what you were talking about. It's revive me. And so I think of it like a doctor. When you go in and you have your heart has stopped, and that doctor has to bring you back to life, that's what God does to us. Yes. And so somebody who's dead spiritually, they need Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, to shock them back to life and revive them. That's what happened to me when I got saved. That's what happened to Steve when he got saved. That's what happened to every single one of you in here. But you have to keep, you know, like the heartbeat, you know, if we get weak, you know, in the hospital, it starts to, you know, go slower and slower. We have to stay in tune with him to keep it pumping right. And it is so exciting to live for Jesus Christ. It has not gotten me said, I have never been bored in my life since meeting Jesus. When you meet him, how can you ever be bored again? And my history goes back with the Raven Hills to 1977 when I was two years saved and going to David Wilkerson's Bible School, and your dad was a, one of the teachers. What a privilege that was, that he played a part in laying the foundation in Steve and myself, way back then, being only saved two years. And then we go and we do a lot of different things, and we come back from the mission field, and what if we, we want to go back to that same area? where your dad was living. And I remember when we came back from the mission field and Steve called your dad. It had been a long drive. Long drive. And Steve asked if he could meet up with your dad. And he goes, okay, meet up in 30 minutes. And he goes, well, I've actually driven all day long. Can we do it tomorrow? And he goes, okay. And he hung up on, hung up on it. And Steve turned to me and he goes, I think my just hung up on me. And he goes, and I said, wow. And he goes, I'm going to call him back and tell him I can be there in 30 minutes. And he called him back, and he was over there in 30 minutes. And he, when he walks in, he hands him a card, and he said, and the card says, a man that is intimate with God will not be intimidated by man. And he hands it to him, he goes, so that was a test. He goes, yes, that was a test. But I got to know, not, you know, we hear so much about your dad, but your mom was powerful. And I could go into a whole long story 
happy about your dad's books and your mom and us living here for three years and having them speak into our heart. When you walked into the room, you knew that you wanted to be in the presence of God. Not in the presence of man, but the presence of God. And it stirred up inside of him, inside of Steve and inside of me, more of what we've been saying now. You know, it was two years, and then all of a sudden, the missions and everything, it had been closer to 20 now. And we were still hungry, and I wanted more. And Steve went to him one day and he said, he goes, I have such a burden and a weight from the world for people. He goes, it's too heavy to bear. And he said, Brother Lynn, would you please pray it off of me? He goes, why would I do that when I prayed it on you? <laughs> but during the Brownsville revival, we were there. We were living in the area when your dad passed. And Steve wanted to pray him back. Mom said, he doesn't want to come back here when he's tasting heaven. And she passed away in Argentina, I think. Right? Yes. And during the Brownsville revival, when we came back from Argentina, David and Nancy came and were part of the Brownsville revival. And they carried that presence of God. And they were instilling in the Bible school students the presence of God. But did we get a chance to hang out during that time? Did we go out and, you know, eat? And... <laughs> they worked and taught at the Bible school. Steve prepared a message and preached every single night. I was homeschooling my kids and going to services every night. So we saw each other in passing. We were on a mission, were we not? On a mission. And it has been a mission of a lifetime ever since we met him, ever since you guys met him. You've been on a mission to impart to us the presence of God. And that's what it's all about, is his presence. I love him so much. I want to introduce to you David Renfield and Nancy.
given to us because it uh, says it pertains to everything. It pertains to life and governance, everything you need to know, whether it's about marriage, raising children, finances, or whatever, everything is contained in the Word of God. The Word of God is relevant, and I think this particular portion of Scripture is relevant to the day and age in which you and I live. And so I want to uh, break it down uh, for you. I've got six points. I normally don't do this. But uh, number one, it's time to wise up. Number two, it's time to wake up. Number three, it's time to clean up. Number four, it's time to dress up. Number five, it's time to grow up. And number six, it's time to lock up. You will notice as we uh, go through this portion of scripture that uh, uh, Paul is borrowing a page, if you like, out of our everyday routine. Some of you this morning, you became aware of the, uh, the time you realized maybe you slept in or you forgot to set the alarm and so on, and, uh, and so you uh, wised up and said to your wife, or if you're married, or husband, listen, we need to get going, you know, it's time, we need to wake up, you know, rub the sleep out of your eyes and so on. After we wake up, we clean up, isn't that right? After we clean up, we dress up and so on. So this is a routine that every single one of us goes through on a natural level, but on a spiritual level also, it's true. So let's begin again. It's time to wise up. I don't know if that expression is used as much as it used to be. I'm getting pretty old now, 77 years of age, 78 this year. But uh, 15, 20, 30 years ago, we would use the expression wise up. We meant, you know, you've got your head buried in the sand. You don't know what's going on. You're ignorant. Don't, you know, don't you watch the news and so on and so forth. Wise up. And I believe that's what uh, Paul is saying here. He says, do this knowing the time. In other words, wise up. Get with it. And the problem is, he said, uh, knowing the time. What does that mean exactly when we say know the time? The time is so vast. There's no way in which we can uh, understand time unless we break it down into increments. Isn't that right? It's like length. You're going to a hardware store and you say, listen, I need a length of roll. And the guy's going to look at you like, okay, you need a length of roll. You know, sort of define what you mean by length. You want 10 feet, you want 50 feet, you want 100 feet, you want a mile of roll. And so on, time is the same way. The only way we can understand time, again, is to break it down. We talk about time in the sense of a millennium, a thousand years, or a, or a decade, 10 years, and so on. If you take your car in for repair, and you say to the mechanic, when will it be ready? And he says, sometime. Well, I don't know about you, but that's not good enough for me. That may be in my lifetime, it may be in my children's uh, lifetime, my grandchildren's lifetime, and so on. I need something more specific. And so we break down time down, don't we? We say, listen, give me a few minutes. You know, I'll come back in an hour, or sometime this afternoon, it won't be ready for three days. Or it's going to be next week before we know it. In other words, we've got to define time a little more specifically in order to understand it. And the Greeks, and I'm not an expert when it comes to Greek and Hebrew. My father used to say he knew a little Greek and a little Hebrew. The Hebrew ran a delicatessen and the Greek had a clothing store. But, um, you know, that's not my expertise when it comes to Greek and Hebrew too. But I think all this, the word that Paul uses here for the word time is the word kairos. And it means a very specific moment in time. It has behind it the, uh, the sense of seizing or grasping the moment. This specific moment in time. I don't know how many hunters are out here. Anybody willing to acknowledge that you belong to the NRA or anything? Okay. Uh, okay. But, uh, you know, if you're a hunter, you go up there somewhere out into the, uh, the woods, you climb up in your blind and you're waiting for that trophy buck to, uh, to appear. And there's a little opening, maybe, uh, you know, 50 feet across, and you hear a rustle in the leaves, you've been waiting there for the early hours of the morning, and all of a sudden this beautiful deer steps in, that is a kind of rust moment. If I don't squeeze the trigger in the next uh, five or ten seconds, that thing is going to go. Or maybe you're a fisherman, you're out on the lake, and you're using a bobber, and that thing is sitting motionless on top of the water, and then all of a sudden it begins to move like this. And you know, any moment I need to set the hook. Any fisherman here? Fisher women, you better be politically correct. <laughs> but you know the and those are Kairos moments. You know, it's, uh, it's the sale that's on from two to five, 40% off, and all the ladies are lined up, you know, from 
three days, and I don't get in at that particular moment in time, that dress that I've been looking at, or that handbag, or whatever it is at first, you know, I'm not going to make it. I'll be first at the auction house. And you get distracted momentarily. You've got your eye on some object, and uh, all of a sudden you hear the hammer going, you know, going one straight, you know, if you can, the Kairos moment. And so Paul is speaking here about knowing this specific moment in time. Let me ask you this, do you know what time it is? I'm not asking you to look at your Rolex or your Timex. I'm asking you, do you know spiritually what time, what season we are in? Jesus reprimanded very strongly the, uh, the Pharisees for not knowing the time. He said, you guys could get a job at the Weather Channel. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. He says, you know how to discern the weather. You know, you can tell whether it's going to be a good day, a bad day, and so on and so forth. But he said, you don't have a clue as to the time which you're living. In fact, one of the saddest verses in the Bible, I think, they miss the day of their visitation. They miss the day of their visitation. Here were men that uh, disciplined themselves to study the Word of God, to memorize the Word of God, and so on. And yet the living Word of God stood right in their midst, and they were absolutely blinded to it. Amazing, isn't it? Miss the day of their visitation. The Bible has a lot to say about time. Redeeming the time. For the days are evil. In other words, redeem it, begin to use it wisely, and so on. And so there's uh, many, many scriptures. John talks about this is the last hour. Can you imagine, 2,000 years ago, the Apostle John was speaking about time, and he said, this is the last hour. If that was true then, then certainly now we're down to the closing moments, if you like, of time. 1 Corinthians 7 says, time is short. And so on and on, the Bible talks about the a matter of time that we will give an account, I believe, not only for every idle word, but we'll give an account for our time. I sort of hope not, because I've got a lot of wasted time. I'm sure you do too. But do we really redeem the time? Do we use it for the purpose of God and, and so on? Or do we uh, squander it? Most of you are aware of uh, Matthew chapter 24, where the disciples come to Jesus and they say, listen, uh, you know, you've been talking about many things, but uh, you're going to come again, what are some of the signs of your coming? What are some of the things that we can look for? To use Jonathan Kahn's expression, what are the harbingers? You know, he dug that word up somewhere out of the dictionary, and uh, it's become, you know, toss aside this harbinger, I don't think people in Calcutta could care less about a tree growing in uh, Manhattan, but the true harbingers are there in Matthew 24. I know that we get used to looking at them, but turn with me, if you will, to Matthew 24. Let's just look at some of these things that Jesus mentioned. I want to elaborate on them a little bit because we read these. If you've been raised in church like I have, if you've been saved for any length of time, you know Matthew chapter 24. We can rattle it off. You know, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, pestilence, all those things. But let me uh, break down some of these things. Right now, there's 192, the last time I checked, 192 nations embroiled in some type of conflict in the world. We talk about wars and rumors of wars. The Bible says there in verse 7, nation will rise against nation. The word nation there is the word ethnos. In other words, eth uh, uh, race against race. We're seeing that in America right now, aren't we? trying to pit the black lines against the white lines, and so on, the brown lines, and all the division that is coming on. Again, a sign that we're living in the last days. Nation will rise against nation, race against race. Not just nation in the sense of America against Canada type thing, or Mexico, but within our own nation, the division that has uh, been brought about. We've had 150 major wars since World War II. Not we as Americans, but around the world. 150 major wars. If you're not living there, obviously it's not major, but that's the, the fact that there's been that many. And then Jesus talked about uh, the fact that there would be earthquakes. These are statistics that I've uh, checked uh, a number of times. 21 major earthquakes between the year 100 and the year 1800. 21 major earthquakes in a 1700 year period. Between 1800 and 1900, not 1700 years, but 100 years, or 18 major earthquakes. Between 1900 and 1950, there were 13. Between 1950 and 1991, 93. 
We have 130,000 earthquakes every year between 3 and 3.9, 13,000 between 4 and 4.9, 1,300 between 5 and 5.9, 134 between 6 and 6.9, 17 between 7 and 7.9. In other words, there is an increase of earthquake activity. Jesus said these are the beginning of earthquakes. Those of you who are mothers here, you know that when the contractions begin, they do not diminish as the baby approaches. Isn't that right? The contractions get closer and closer. Jesus said, listen, there's going to be an increase of activity. We're seeing a major increase of activity now. The devastation that is caused. Nancy and I, many years ago, were down in New Zealand visiting our youngest daughter and our grandkids. And all of a sudden, she was upstairs praying, and I was downstairs waiting for a friend past the friend, and all of a sudden that house began to shake. I mean, it was just absolutely violently shaken. Part of the wall fell out, so on I screamed for my wife to get out of there. But the city of Christchurch was devastated. Billions of dollars worth of damage in just a matter of seconds. And again, we're going to see an increase of that around the world. Then famine. The Bible talks about famine. Nine million people die every year of famine. Six million children known at the age of five will die of hunger. 800 million people suffer from malnutrition and are predicting now the change in the weather and so on. That there's going to be an increase in famines, obviously, in keeping with the Word of God. The Word of God is, uh, you know, is uh, tomorrow's news. I think sometimes we look at the Bible, there's always some stuffy old book that pertains to things that happened years ago. Obviously, we have the history of, you know, uh, the children of Israel and so on, but it also speaks about tomorrow what we can look for. The Word of God is relevant. We need to understand that. Pestilence, we've had 30 previously unknown diseases in the, since 1973. And of course, right now we're in one, that's why we're sitting uh, spaced out and so on and so forth. We've had Ebola and now the coronavirus and so on and so forth with all our you know, expertise and so on. Pestilence is increasing. Persecution. They average about 163,000 people die every year for the cause of Christ. I'm sure it's even higher from, uh, than that, but uh, there's been more people die for their faith since 1900, since all the previous history of the world. In other words, uh, you take all of history, and from 1900 to the present, more people have died for their faith than all those previous centuries combined. Bible says we will be hated by all nations. I have been predicting for many, many years, I still believe I'm right, that it won't be too long before we have an underground church in America. Not out of uh, fear, but out of necessity. They're beginning to burn churches now, they're burning Bibles and so on. We are hated. Psalm 2 is being fulfilled. The kings of the earth take uh, counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear apart their fellows. You see, the church puts feathers on the world. A feather is something that restrains, it holds things in. I have a belt to hold things in. <laughs> but uh, you know, the, the church holds things in. We say it's wrong to do this. We say it's wrong to do that. that uh, homosexuality is wrong. Or abortion is wrong. Pedophiles are wrong. And so on and so forth. And the world is getting to the point where they don't want to hear that anymore. Let's break off those feathers. We want to be free to do whatever we want to do. If I want to marry my cat, I can marry my cat, you know. If I want to have sex with my dog, I can have sex with my dog. Now they've passed the wall where you can have uh, more than one wife. Because in Massachusetts uh, recently now that uh, polygamy is uh, it's okay. My father used to say there is a penalty for polygamy. Two mother-in-laws instead of one. But, uh, <laughs> You see the way the world is going. We are the restrained voice. We are the voice that says, don't do it, it's wrong. But now we're saying that right is wrong and wrong is right. Everything is being turned around. Persecution, false, Christ will arise. So think about Matthew 24. It says that there will be an increase. Be not deceived over and over again in this chapter. More than earthquakes, more than anything else, Jesus warned us about deception. And it is spiritual deception. False Christs, false prophets, signs, wonders, miracles, and so on. A number of years ago, I was sitting just uh, meditating on the Word of God, and I thought to myself, you know, I'm not going to be deceived. After all, I've been to Bible school, raised in a Christian home, I've 
sought to study the word of God and nobody's going to come along and deceive me into believing that they are the Christ. I know better than that. And I was sort of priding myself in that sense. And then all of a sudden I felt the Lord say, what does the word Christ mean? False Christ will arise. The word Christ means anointed. False anointings will arise and deceive men. Then I got afraid. What if somebody comes here, holds a series of meetings, people are getting healed, supernatural healings, miracles of all sorts, you've been in church all of your life, you've never seen it, this man is, uh, you know, doing miracles that you've only ever dreamed about or read about, and then over a period of time begins to introduce some sort of a false doctrine and so on, you think, well, you know, this man's got the goods. False Christ will arise, signs, wonders, miracles, and so on. Again, we they estimate that about 2,000 people in America claiming to be Christ of any given time. People, you know, up in the mountains or whatever, they've got their little clan behind them, they're hearing from God, and the people are believing that they are some sort of supernatural incarnation or whatever, and this man's got great wisdom of this woman, and so on. In England now, something like 80,000 registered witches according to the latest statistics, and I read that again last night as I looked up some of these things. We've sold an, an entire generation on Harry Potter books, introduced them into the, the world of the, the occult, 60 million plus books have been sold. We're now teaching yoga in daycare centers where children are tripping out, going on in demonic uh, trips and so on, and yet it's coming to the church, it's prevalent now, as though yoga is the answer for everything. Every position obviously is a position of worship to a foreign god. Again, all of these things are things that the Bible talks about. Drugs, the Bible talks about in Revelation, the whole world is going to be deceived by her sorceries. It's the word in the Greek, pharmakia, the word we get our word pharmacy from. Drug addiction, as you know, one of the major problems. It goes on to say, as it was in the days of Noah, what happened in the days of Noah, the minds of men were absolutely perverse, perverted. We have pornography, one of the big major problems. Our church back home now, I say back home down the road here, is uh, we've been on a five or ten week, I think it's about a ten week thing, we're halfway through now, trying to deal with this area. It's something that most of us don't really want to admit to. Isn't that right? In an average church, and hopefully this is not an average church in that sense, 50% or more of the men are struggling with pornography. And the women sit there and say, you know, those men got such evil minds and so on. I was walking through our living room back where uh, we used to live in Texas and Steve used to come and visit and um, turned on the television one day and just happened to be strolling through, turned it on, and I didn't know what was on, but it was Oprah Winfrey. She was uh, just entering into her little monologue of uh, opening up her uh, meeting or whatever you want to call it for the day her show and uh, she began to talk about this industry and I missed the first part but she said this industry is one of the largest industries in the world it's bigger than General Motors, it's bigger than Ford, it's bigger than um, General Electric and so on and so forth and she said I'm talking about pornography and then she made this statement that got my attention for sure she said the largest consumers of pornography in America are not men but women She's far from being a godly woman, but she was honest and she said women have a different type of pornography. They get into the soap operas and the romance novels and so on. In other words, they fantasize, I wish this was my husband, or I wish I was married, to, and they get absorbed, and she called it pornography. It is pornography. Yes, that's right. Amen. They estimate now, and uh, nobody knows for sure, between 25 and 250 million pornographic websites. Conservatively between 20 and 25, the high end 250 million pornographic websites. That's how prevalent pornography is. 57 billion dollar a year business. 3 billion alone in child pornography. 4.5 billion dollars a year in phone sex. 2.5 billion pornographic emails go out every single day. 27,000 people visit pornographic websites every second. 76% of ministers admit to visiting a pornographic website. 
One out of every five children will be abused. Promise Keepers, it was popular years ago, did a survey. These were men being challenged to take the lead in the home to be the spiritual head of the family and so on. Over 50% said that they had a problem with pornography. Again, the spiritual leaders, supposedly. AIDS, another major problem as far as plagues and so on. 20 million people have died already of AIDS. I think it's higher than that. He's a little old now. And so on. Human trafficking, between 7 to 9 million dollars are spent every year in human trafficking. 27 million slaves, sex slaves worldwide. I watched an ABC program years ago of a man that left New York City within five years, five days, sorry, five hours of leaving New York City. He landed in Haiti. He had secured for himself a young man, I think, uh, actually bought the man, could use him and abuse him whatever way he wanted sexually and get rid of him at the end of his uh, period of time. I mean, they follow this. That's what's going on in this world. They say that uh, uh, the entire population of Texas crosses international borders every year. So like 27 million people are trafficked every single year from nation to nation and so on and so forth, a major problem. And catastrophes that we see that are taking place, Luke talks about perplexity of roaring of the seas. In other words, we can't understand what's going on. The tsunamis that have wiped out thousands, tens of thousands, in fact, hundreds of thousands of people, 200,000 killed in the tsunami in Southeast Asia, and so on, all of these things. Again, those are some of the signs of what we are seeing today. I thought I would refresh your memory, and I'm going to ask you again, you know what time it is. Again, this is a season where we need to be alert to what is going on. So it's time to wise up, it's time to wake up and rub the sleep out of our eyes, if you like, and so on. And then it's time, again, to seriously wake up. I mean, spiritually wake up. The Bible, many, many times, talk about awake, thou that sleepest. The church of Sardis in the New Testament there, in the book of Revelation, God says you need to wake up. It's easy to sleep, isn't it? Thessalonians says this in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 6, Let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Let us not sleep as others do. Is, is Paul writing here about, the, you know, a brand new type of uh, Christianity where you don't sleep, you deprive yourself of sleep? No, because the Bible says God gives his beloved sleep. He's talking about the sleep of indifference, of apathy, of let lethargy, of complacency, of just having again your head buried in the sand, not being aware of what is going on around about you spiritually. And it's so easy to lull ourselves to sleep, isn't that right? We need to uh, wake up. The Bible loves, or the Bible, I should say, the enemy loves a sleeping church. Let me say that again. The enemy loves a sleeping church. I guarantee if you have a sign made and you put it in your tra uh, front yard that says, this family sleeps very soundly, you are going to open the door to every thief in the block of the community. Because they know we are not going to have any problem breaking into this house because they admit they sound, uh, they're, they're sound sleepers. And the enemy likewise looks for those that are sleeping. He could move in. We've got to wake up. We've got to ask God, Lord, shake me, spiritually speaking, shake me. You know the story of Samson and Delilah. Philistines, again, were terrorized by this man. He was doing all sorts of signs, wonders, miracles, if you like, because of the supernatural power of God that rested upon that Nazarite power. And so they solicited the help of his girlfriend, Delilah. She was the undercover agent. She had to figure out where does this guy get his strength from? It doesn't make sense. Where's he got this power? There's some sort of supernatural power here. We've got to learn to tap this and turn it off if we can. And of course, you know, he was wise to the fact that she was after the source of his strength. And so we had a little bit of fun at her expense. We'll try this and try that and so on and so forth. Then it didn't work. And then he would, uh, you know, uh, roar with laughter, I'm sure, and so on and belittle her. And then she tried something that never fails. Tears. Us guys, ladies, whether you know it or not, we're suckers for the tears. 
As soon as the tears begin, all of a sudden, you know, that toughness goes, oh, I'm so sorry, I should get this. And she tries tears, and he tells her the truth. I'm an Aslan. I've never had my hair cut. I've made a vow to God to live a life of purity and so on. And now she knows that I've finally tapped into the source of this man's strength. But you know what? She's powerless to do anything about it. And so she does one thing. She gets him to sleep. And the Bible says she made him sleep on her knees. And while he was asleep, the enemy moved in. Shaved his head, basically, he woke up the power of God. While he was sleeping. Remember the story of the ten virgins. Oh, they were anticipating the arrival of the bridegroom. They were out there, their lamps were burning, but there was a delay. They all got drowsy and they began to sleep. And all of a sudden there was a sound, the cry of the bridegroom coming, and they woke up, but their lamps were out of oil, at least five of them. And by the time they got back, they were shut out from going in. Possibly one of the hardest scriptures in the, the Bible to explain. They were virgins. They were anticipating the arrival of the bridegroom. And yet they never made it by the time they got there and got the right and they had their, their lamps burning brightly again. The door was already closed. Again, while they were sleeping. Remember the story of the uh, disciples? There in the garden, and Jesus went a little ahead of them and said, Listen, you guys watch and pray. Specifically, he said that to Peter. He comes back an hour later, Peter is fast asleep. Could you not watch with me one hour? And you warned Peter. As a result of Peter sleeping again, he denied the Lord three times. Again, while they were sleeping, Matthew chapter 13 talks about the man that sowed seed in his field. But then while he was sleeping, the enemy came and he sowed tears amongst the, the wheat. Again, it all takes place while we're sleeping. And I think spiritually things are taking place right, right now that we are not aware of unless we're in tune with God, unless we're seeking God, unless we're waiting on God, unless we're sensitive to the voice of God. So it's time again to wake up. The third thing, it's time to clean up. And again, after you wake up, you clean up. Isn't that right? I'm sure most of you here are headed into the shower this morning, or bath, whatever it is, and so on. Brush your teeth, brush your hair if you have any. And, uh, you know, you got dressed. And so you began to uh, clean up. Paul says here, laying aside the deeds of darkness. Laying aside the deeds of darkness. In the natural, we lay aside the things that we slept in. Anybody still got their pajamas on here? I doubt. We lay aside the night attire, if you like. We put on clothes befitting the day. But spiritually, we're to do the same thing. We lay aside the deeds, the actions of darkness. Darkness is anything that is contrary to the light. We are to walk in the light as he is in the light. Men love what? Darkness because their deeds are evil. Paul is saying, let's wake up number one and then clean up number two. The great message prior to the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is a message of repentance. Those of you who are familiar with Brownsville or Pensacola Revival, that was Steve's burden night after night after night. A message basically, if you summarize it in one word, repentance. Getting rid of sin, turning away from sin, cleaning up your act. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's coming back for a bride. A bride without spot or wrinkle. My father had used to uh, pastor in England when I was a little boy. And just uh, around the, the war years, uh, material for wedding dresses was very rare. Things were rationed. I still remember my mother, we had a little book like a passport. When you went, you could get up on the you know, so many pounds of butter for the month and so much sugar for the month and they would actually stamp in the book to show that you'd already, you know, had your uh, supply of whatever it was that you were buying. But material, because of the war endeavor, uh, material for wedding dresses was not a priority. And so what would happen, my dad said, they would take the lace curtains, the old lace curtains, and they would bleach them as white as possible and turn them into wedding dresses. And my father said, I've seen many a bride come down the aisle in a dress made out of wedding, uh, made out of uh, curtain material. 
But he says, I've never seen a dirty bride yet. I've never seen a dirty bride yet. He's coming for a bride without a spot or wrinkle. And it's our job to get ready for that, to anticipate that. The Bible says in Revelation, the bride has made herself ready. She's anticipating. Every bride knows, even down to almost a second. When's your wedding? Oh, it's you know, four days and six hours from now, or whatever. Three days and two hours from now. I mean, there's an anticipation, there's a joy. There's, you know, they know exactly. We should be the same way. To them that what? Look for him. He will appear a second time. Does that mean if we're not looking, he won't appear? Maybe. Are you looking for him? Is that longing? Is that, that, that desire to be with him? To no longer see him through a glass darkly, but see him face to face. Again, it's time to uh, clean up. Revelation chapter 16. It says in verse 5 there, stay awake and keep your garments white. In other words, you've got both of those things. Stay awake. In other words, don't get too weary in well-doing. Don't get complacent. Don't allow that apathy to come into your life. But stay awake. Stay alert. And then keep your garments white. That's a responsible, a responsible that you and I have. We are to purge ourselves. Isn't that right? No, that may sound very Catholic or Roman Catholic and so on. But we have a responsibility. Is that right? To keep ourselves pure, keep ourselves clean. Passover, they were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, but the moment that Passover ended, another feast began, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was a responsibility of every Jew to ransack their house and find if there was any trace of leaven whatsoever. And if there was, it was their responsibility to take it out. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But the moment you and I are redeemed, it's our responsibility to keep our house unleavened, to remove the leaven. Yes. And it's interesting to, to note that if they didn't, they were cut off. You can put that in your theology. It's the greatest answer to eternal security in the Word of God. One of the great preachers of all time, Spurgeon said, the day will come when his teachings will be worth their weight in gold. This man said there's two ways in which an Israelite could lose his life, spiritually speaking. One, if he never applied the blood to the doorposts of his house. The death angel would have taken him out along with the children of uh, the Egyptians. But then he says this, he said after applying the blood, if he failed to remove leaven, he was also cut off. There in typology is the greatest answer to eternal security. You and I have a responsibility by the grace of God to walk in purity. Seven days, meaning God expects us the moment we are born again of the Spirit of God to walk in absolute purity in our life. Not in our own strength, but He supplies the grace of God. Again, He's coming back to a church without suffering. I remember one of the altar calls at, uh, in Pensacola. We had a, every night there was hundreds of people that would come forward. But this particular night, it was an exceptionally large crowd. We used to sit on the stage. I never liked that, but they'd asked me to sit up there. And uh, so they asked the, some of the pastors on the stage if they would come down because they needed extra counselors. And I just randomly walked up to a man to pray with him. And uh, he said to me, he said, you know, he said, I'm, a, I'm an evangelist. He said, I travel the world. He said, I have a message of faith. And he said, uh, as Steve was preaching tonight, he said, God spoke to me and said, Brother, without faith, it's impossible to please me. But then he said, immediately after he gave me that verse, the Spirit of God said, But without holiness, no man will see the Lord. And he said, I'm here because there are things in my life that I know are not pleasing to God. Oh, he had a message of faith, and that's wonderful. But without holiness, no man will see God. I was able to pray for him. I don't know his name or anything like that, but I'll never forget that. Oh, I traveled the world with the faith message. But tonight, the Spirit of God, through Steve's preaching, zeroed in on things in my life that are not pleasing to God. I want to see him. Without holiness, no man will see him. This is the great message that is needed, I believe, in the church today. It's a message of holiness, of repentance, of getting right with God, living a life of purity, integrity, and so on. You 
recall the story of Jesus coming there just uh, prior to the crucifixion with a, a bowl of water and beginning to wash the disciples' feet. They were humiliated. Their master, this was the job of the, the lowliest of servants to wash the feet of those that were walked into the house. And yet here is the master. He's good himself about. He's taken on the form of a servant and he's beginning to wash the disciples' feet. He comes to Peter. You know the story. Peter says, no way. You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part of me. If I don't wash you, Peter, you have no part of me. I believe the Spirit of God today is coming to the church, not with a basin of water so much as a basin of blood, and said, unless you allow me to wash you, you and I don't have any relationship. You can have no part of me. Be holy as I am holy. Again, we need to clean up. Number four, it's time to dress up. One thing that I've discovered about America, came over here when I was 15 years of age, I became aware of the amazing amount of fashions that we have. Clothing, we have clothing for virtually everything, don't we? I mean, I'm talking about specialized clothing. You know, if you're cutting down a tree, then, uh, you know, you need your red plaid shirt and your steel <laughs> coat and boots and, uh, and so on. Yeah. If you're playing tennis, then, uh, you know, you get your sweatband and the white shorts and tennis shoes and so on. You know, if you're ice skating, again, you've got a whole other outfit. If you're into cycling, there's a whole other outfit that you can put on if you're into football. All sorts of, I mean, you know, we've got zillions of different types of clothing depending on the activity that we're involved in. You know, if you're a jogger, you strip down, you know, if you drive a Harley Davidson, you've got your leathers. I mean, you know, it, it's endless. Casual clothes and so on. I go past the steam and I said, by the way, what's your, your dress schedule? Oh, your, your dress uh, uh, situation there. And he said, well, sometimes I'm in blue jeans and sometimes. So I thought, well, uh, you know, I'll do a sort of a mediocre, I left my bow tie. No. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're going to a wedding, chances are you're going to dress up. If you're going to a funeral, chances are you're going to dress up. But when you're frolicking with the kids, chances are you're going to put on some sweats and, or whatever. You know, we, we have different clothes for different sorts of activities, isn't that right? And notice what Paul says here about getting dressed. He says, put on the armor. Don't put on a tuxedo. Don't put on your sweats, don't put on your hoodie. Put on the armor. Why do we put on an armor? Because we're in a battle. We have an adversary, you have an adversary. He is the devil. He goes around seeking whom he may devour. And he knows everything about your life, he knows everything about my life. Not because he's omniscient, as I tell people, but because he's a good fisherman. Those of you who understand fishing, they'll understand this illustration. The rest of you could not offer a moment. But, uh, you know, we have different lures. And you put that lure on the end of your line, you cast it out there, and you throw it through the water, and you maybe do that 10 or 15 times. If you don't get a bite, then you think, you know, they're not attracted to this particular lure. And so you change it, or put on another color, maybe, and try it again. And the moment you get a strike, okay, they seem to like this one. Or you change that, and, you know. But you figure out what appeals to the fish. And the enemy, long ago, before you even knew he was fishing, comes to your mind and he throws in different lures. Anger, resentment, pride, bitterness, lust, whatever. And the moment you grab that thing, he knows what's wrong. And he will use that over and over and over and over and over again. It becomes your besetting sin. The devil has figured it out long ago. That's why he always harasses you with the same thing. And until you build up a resistance to that, until you understand that, you will be plagued with that till the day that you die. He is smart and he's good at what he does. Yes. So we put on an armor. There's a battle raging. We've got to learn to overcome. Not, over, not only overcome in the sense of our own individual struggles and so on, but there is an even bigger battle going on for our nation right now. Is that right? 
This is possibly one of the most critical years, if not the most critical year, that America has ever faced. There are principalities and powers that are being loosed against this nation, that spirit of lawlessness, again, heading up to the man of lawlessness that is about to come one of these days. And we've got to be able to pull down strongholds. We're mighty, the Bible says. Mighty, more than adequate to the pulling down of strongholds. There is a spirit that is seeking to destroy this nation. I call it the minor leagues and the major, major leagues. Minor leagues, we were all involved in. Our personal devils, if you like, will be after that. But we need to make the transition from the minor to the majors, and not too many people do. There are principalities and powers that we need to recognize and make declarations as we declared on one of those songs this morning. You should are against the enemy. We exalt the old, and so on. I won't get into that any more than that, but uh, it's time again to dress up. How do we dress up? It says there that we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Which brings me to number five, it's time to grow up. Let us behave properly. You see, your dress affects your behavior. I used to travel a lot uh, for 22, three years, and not stopped traveling around this nation, some of the nations of the world, I've been in airports all over, and you see military people in their dress fatigue. And boy, that's just the way in which they walk when they're in uniform. They are proud of the fact that they represent the United States Navy, Army, or whatever it is, and so on and so forth. You know, I don't see them frolicking on the ground with a two-year-old when they're dressed in their dress fatigues. And the way in which we dress should affect our behavior. The Bible says that we not only put on the armor of white, but we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine if we had coats here this morning and I'd introduced maybe, you know, very serious introduction about this great man of God, very solemn, great, you know, and I step out and I got flaming red hair, great big red nose, I've got a bow tie that's two feet wide, it's blinking, I've got an oversized suit on, one, one side is yellow, the other side is green, I've got trousers on that are, you know, about this wide. Again, one side is all polka dot and so on. I come out dressed like a clown. What do you expect? Imagine if I came out like that and I said, listen, let's bow heads and pray. You think it was part of the routine that I'm making a joke. Why if I'm dressed like a clown, I should act like a clown. You expect me to start pulling my handkerchief out, you know. And all sorts of crazy things. Why if that's the way I'm dressed? So you expect me to act the way I'm dressed. You know, God expects us to act the way we're dressed. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we make no provision for flesh. It's time to grow up. Let us behave properly. Let us behave properly. Not in carousing and drunkenness. That's an expression, according to William Barclay, it's an expression that was used by rabble-rousers that would come through a town or a village, you know, drunk, out of control, just boisterous, regardless of the fact that people are trying to sleep and so on and so forth. Thank God that uh, hopefully we're not involved in that, but uh, drunk, out of control, sexual promiscuity, that desire for the forbidden dead, having no values outside of marriage. And so on. These are things, obviously, that have no part in Christian life, sensuality, having no shame regarding sin. Goodness, it was only 10 years ago, maybe not something like that, but Ellen DeGeneres and all of these uh, perverts were put off television and so on, but now we accommodate them and, and look up to them as, you know, sort of the having made it. Isn't that right? Yes. The whole community have come out of the closet now. They're no longer ashamed. The Rosie O'Donnells and so on and so forth. Boy, I mean, it's only in our lifetime, 20 years ago, whatever they were frowned upon, now you can't say a thing against it, otherwise you're the one that's going to be locked up. Is that right? Again, shame, there's no shame, openly flaunting sin, strife, the lust for power, and so on. Paul says, listen, put all those things aside, Draw up, stop behaving properly. Paul says, uh, wasn't it, to the Romans, 
gospel is blasphemed because of you. In other words, they've looked at your life and they've blasphemed the gospel because you're not an example of what the, God, uh, of what the Christian life is supposed to be about. People are watching you. Is that right? The Bible says you and I are epistles. I know the Bible says we can't add to the word of God, but in that sense, you and I are epistles. We're written and read of all men. The only Bible some people will ever read is your life and mine. I have at the front of my Bible a poem, which was the very first poem I ever memorized. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes of better pupil are more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. The best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds. For to see good put in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it, if you let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. The lectures you deliver may be wise and true, but I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. I may not understand the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. We are epistles, written and read of all men. And people are watching us and observing us, and Paul says, listen, behave properly. Again, it's time to grow. One of Paul's greatest burdens was the fact that he had a whole bunch of babies, even in the Corinthian church, and he's pleading. You know, if I could uh, do my own translation of the Bible, he says, listen, I would love to take you to the outback. But I've got to buy a home church. And that's what he says in essence. You know, you can't digest solid food. You've got to live on milk. And Paul's greatest burdens. Why? Because they didn't grow, they didn't mature. I mean, travel, he says, until Christ be formed in you. The great need of the church is that we begin to grow up. It's not enough just to accept Christ as your Savior. There's nothing more wonderful than a baby. There's nothing more tragic than that baby not maturing. Church is full of immature babies that don't read the Word of God, they don't pray, they don't spend time seeking God. And as a result, we've got to spoon feed them day after day after day. We've got to run to the pastor with all of our problems and so on. And we've got to grow up. Our time is getting away on us. Let me take you to the last one, number six. It's time to lock up. Verse 14, he says, And make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision. See, when you want to do something, you make provision. Imagine if uh, I went to your house. I've never been to your house before, but as I drive in the driveway, I notice that there is a caravan. Behind the caravan, there's a boat. On the boat, there's a bunch of jet skis and so on. There's some sleeping bags lying around, fishing poles and so on. I know that you are making provision to go camping. Either that or you've been camping. In other words, you've gathered together all the things that are necessary to accomplish a given task. And the Bible says, make no provision for the flesh. Don't go in the places where the flesh is going to be ministered to, so to speak. Stay away from that. We have a classic illustration in Proverbs of chapter 7 of the young man, the young foolish man, who makes his way into the red light district, if you like, the prostitute area, a town. And she comes out to greet him. And she uses spirituality. Oh, I've offered my offerings this morning. You know, I just came from church too. Oh, by the way, the man of the house, you know, my husband's out of town. He's going to be gone on a long journey. He's not going to be back until the full moon. That's the way they measure the weeks there. In other words, nobody's going to discover it. Let's have our fill of love. Let's have some fun sexually. Nobody will find out. The man of the house isn't going to be back for weeks. The Bible says with her flattering eyes and so on, she seduces him. And at the end of the chapter, it says that many are slain that way. He makes his way into an area where he knows there's trouble. Listen, turn off the computer at certain hours or whatever it is. Avoid certain things. Avoid certain people. Bad company corrupts good morals. Stay away from those things. We can do it. Remember my good friend, Winky Pratt, some of you may know that name. You know, he said he, he used to have people come up to him and say, you know, I just have a problem with cheating. I'm always cheating. I can't stop it. Or I have a problem with stealing. Or I have a problem with this or that. 
He says, well, let me ask you a question. Do you steal when your mother and father are watching? No, of course not. Do you swear when your mother and father are watching? No, of course not. He said, then you can control it. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. We have a will that God has given us. And that will has the power to make choices. Choose you this day. I'll serve this or I'll serve that. We are not under the dominion of sin. Sin shall not have what? Dominion over you, power over you. Once you are born again of the Spirit of God, there is a greater power that resides in you that gives you the power over the power of the enemy. And we can lock up. I don't have to allow that thing to come into my life. The last church next to that pastor was up in the Seattle area, a <clears throat> little place called Big Carl, Washington. I was always the last one out of the church. Took the uh, pastors, I guess, shaking hands and this and that. So after everybody left, I would go through and make sure all the Lights were up in the bathrooms and so on and so forth. All the doors were locked, and then I go to the, the front door and make sure that the door was locked. In other words, I locked that door so nobody could enter. And spiritually, we've got to do the same thing. Do not give place to the devil. We can open the door by unforgiveness, by sin, whatever it is. We've got to learn to lock up. And by the grace of God, by the Spirit of God, we can, again, live a godly life. So we are to uh, make no provision. The Bible says flee from mutual lusts and so on. And I'm sure you're aware of all those scriptures and so on. Let me add one final one, if you like, number seven. I didn't read it at the beginning. It's time to act up. I know that's a negative expression, but I'm going to use it in a positive way because it means, you know, act out what you believe. Act up. But spiritually, we need to act up. Because Paul, if we go back to the beginning, he says, do this. Do this, knowing the time. In other words, don't just be a hearer of the word, do be a doer of the word. Don't just sit there and say, you know, I don't like that message, or I didn't like that message, or this point was good, or that point, whatever, you know, you can criticize that all you like. But listen, don't be a hearer of the word, be a doer. That's what God expects us to do. You can read a cookbook all day long, it won't produce a batch of cookies at the end of the day. Until you do something that it says. You know. And spiritually, you can read this book like the Pharisees and memorize it inside out and so on and so forth, but until you, until you put it into practice and walk in obedience and say, God, by the grace of God, I'm going to follow this recipe, so to speak, then you will have some results. Again, you know what time it is. You're ready to lay aside the deeds of darkness. So you're ready to put on some new clothes, put on the light, get involved, recognize again you've done that, I said, and then lock up. Let's close in prayer. Just while I head to bed this morning, if God has spoken to you, then let's just take a moment. You don't necessarily have to come to this altar. God sees you, He knows you. Maybe there's areas of your life where you say, Lord, you know everything that's going on in my life. Lord, I've strayed, I've been doing things, I've been practicing things. That, Father, I need your forgiveness this morning. Lord, I've been complacent, I've been sleeping, I've been out of touch, I haven't been reading the word, I haven't been studying the word of God. Whatever it is this morning, the Spirit of God is putting his finger on. Don't go out of this building this morning until you've settled that thing once and for all. That's going to put the fear of God in your life. That you don't go back into that same routine that you've been involved in. Become accountable to somebody else and say, brother, sister, whatever. Listen, I need accountability in this area, pornography, whatever other area of bondage you're in this morning. Let the Spirit of God have His own. Let's just take a moment and I'll turn the meeting back over to Pastor Steve here. But let's do some business with God just for a moment here.
church to just anything between you and Jesus, what would that be? Something that you've been convicted of. The Holy Spirit has already spoke to you. If there's anything standing in between you and your relationship with Jesus, come on, let's get that under the blood right now. Come on. You can walk out of here clean, pure. says today is the day of salvation now. Now. Right now is the point of time. It's not tonight or tomorrow. And we'll just get our hearts pure before the Lord today. See what you've got to understand is He's not Lord of everything. He's not Lord at all. If He's not Lord of everything, then he's not Lord at all. That brings it in perspective really quick, doesn't it? Search me, Lord. If there be anything in me that's not of you, ask him to point it out. He will. And he doesn't point anything out without giving you the grace and the strength to remove that out of your life. He's not that kind of He'll point it and he'll show you how to deal with it and he'll remove it. I was praying that prayer this week. Lord, create in me a pure heart. Renew a right spirit, a steadfast spirit within me. That's what the world needs, church. Some Christians that have a pure heart, a steadfast spirit within them. That's you. And that's me. And when he leads me, I will follow. This is where he's leading us today. Cross before us, the world behind us. How we used to say this: religion, religion, religion is hanging around the cross. Christianity is getting up on the cross. Nailing yourself to it. There's a death. There's a burial. Resurrection. The only way there can be a resurrection in your life is if there's a burial. And when you bury that thing, you need to let it stay down for a while. So the very spine of it is broken. And then you resurrect. And you're a new person. You're a new creation. You're a new creature. You've got to be a death. You've got to be a burial. You've got to be a burial. Everybody's heart's clear. Is your heart clear? Heart's got to be clear. The bride of Christ. Amen. Amen. We're on a mission. For the truth of so. something. We're walking the epistles. Amen. Starts when you walk out the door. Get ready. Get ready for those weekly encounters. This is what we've got posted on every door. I can quote it, but I'm going to read it. Mark 16. This is the church. We commission you. Mark 16, 17, and 18. These signs will accompany those who believe. That's a big word, believe. It's, it's a big word. If 
Monday, they will cast out demons. Did anybody cast out any demons this week? Raise your hand if you cast out any demons. Seriously. Raise your hand if you cast out any demons. Raise them up. Right. Amen. You don't have to yell and scream and shout. They will speak in new tongues. Anybody speak in new tongues this week? They will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. And I love this. They, 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 they. Are you getting this? They, 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 they. Not him, and not me, and not her. They, 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 they will lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So go for it. We release you into your harvest field. We bring them here, but we go out and get them. Amen? You, 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 you. In my name, they shall. Just go in His name. You have that authority. You've got to understand where you've been seated and where you've been placed. And the same power that raised him from the dead, remember there's been a resurrection in your life. The same power that raised him from the dead lives on the inside of you. So I'm here for you. And he's delivered a word. But all you need is him. So we just release you. And then it's like, cool. And now we've heard it. Now we're responsible for it. Amen. We're responsible for it till you hear it. When you're when you when you hear it, when the teacher teaches you and they've given you the information, they pointed you to the chapter, and they told you what to do, get ready because you're about to have a test. Once we have knowledge of it, we're required. Amen. Where do I start from here? You've already started. I want to get right in the center of God's will. You're in the center of God's will if you search your heart this morning. You're already in the center of God's will. Get ready to go. Amen? I mean, you received that word this morning. Amen? If you did not receive that word, I don't know that I can help you. Amen? But I believe everybody was helped. Amen? Aren't you glad we don't do self-help messages around here? My God, if we're not good by now, we just need the word. Amen? So praise the Lord, I'm going to give you an opportunity to give an offering to bless um, Brother David and Nancy. This morning, I want everybody, if you're available to do that, or able to do that, to give just some type of gift, whatever it is. <coughs> I want you just to prepare your heart right now. You can give by way of the machine. Please follow the instructions, and when it says done, get done, and then print a receipt. You need to print the receipt. God. So praise the Lord. Let's just ask the Lord right now, Father God, what would you have us to give in this offering to bless them? Lord God, this morning, we want to be a blessing to them. We thank you for sending them our way. Lord, we thank you for your word that was delivered today with power and authority, Lord. And I believe it set somebody free. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. If you've got a gift, so we're just going to pray for them. So tonight o'clock, tonight at six o'clock, we will be praying. Amen. And there will be uh, Tuesday morning instead of intercessory prayer here in the sanctuary at nine thirty. Listen to me. We'll be going to United Church at ten o'clock uh, Tuesday morning instead of meeting here at nine thirty. We'll be praying with Pastor Stephen and his team uh, at United Church Tuesday morning at ten o'clock. But um, we will be here tonight at 6 o'clock, and we're just going to do business. We don't do anything when we come in here except just worship Him and seek His face. Amen? And when we seek His face, everything unfolds. Amen? How many of you are ready for some things to unfold in your life? It'll come through your prayer time. Amen? So we're going to do that tonight at 6. We're excited. Praise the Lord. And, um, Let's just pray for um, Brother Raven Hill and his wife as they um, are getting ready.
ready to transition back to Arkansas to stretch your hand this way. Jared, you just lay your hands on them. Father God, we just pray for this couple, Lord. We thank you for them, God, and what they delivered here today, Lord, and the wonderful things they've done in this region, Lord, over the last year or so, Lord, however long they've been here, God, be with them on their journey back home, Lord, renew them, God, give them strength, Lord, we pray for healing in their, their body, Lord, touch them physically, financially, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, personally, domestic, God, whatever they have need of, Lord, we thank you that you are that to them, in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, we pray, and the church said, Amen. Thank you for coming today. It's good to see you. We love you. We're praying for you. Uh, please, if you need food, um, um, come down front, Ricky. Um, come see Ricky. If you'll just continue to play for me. And uh, come see Ricky. He'll load you up with food to pass out this week. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for coming today. Have a wonderful day in the Lord.